80 and 80 percent lawyers lowers which we don't even know 80 percent lawyers 80 percent lawyers yes 80 percent lawyer god dang it we are the armed attorneys today we're talking about the matt hoover christopher irvin case now a lot of folks have already covered this we have some unique takes we're going to talk about the appeal and kind of where we go from here and we're going to actually have something that you can do to help but before we begin show your support for the second amendment by hitting that like button and to start things off edwin uh, give us kind of a background of what's going on all right well for those of you who don't know uh, these were two men who have now been convicted of conspiring to basically sell machine guns now you may think these are what some super secret arms dealers that are striking deals off in faraway places uh yeah, no I mean, lord of war Correct. Lord of War stuff. No, this is a man who sold a credit card piece of metal that had an etching on it, not even a very thick etching, just an etching of a device called a lightning link, which could be inserted into some, but not all. In fact, I believe uh, not not the majority of AR-15s in order to make them uh, be behave as fully automatics if, in fact, you could get them to work. So he was selling these, uh, then, the, or he was making these and selling them. Then Matt Hoover, uh, actually promoted them on his, on his YouTube page. And so the Je department of justice then felt that he was engaged in the commercial activity of trying to sell these. And that's how he got roped into it as well. Uh, because he was like any other sponsor getting money from the guy who was actually making them. And so that brought him into this web. So not only were they convicted of conspir conspiring to sell these, the originator, Christopher Irvin, was, con was convicted of uh, actually possessing some of these, uh, actually transferring some of these. Structuring payments. And then that is, of course, one of the most outrageous parts about this is that he was convicted of uh, structuring cash payments so that he could avoid uh, structuring cash to avoid currency transaction reporting requirements, which if any of you have ever tried to deposit cash into your bank, uh, you understand how onerous those are. And just as a side note, um, banks used to be our friends. Banks used, like the relationship between a bank customer and a bank used to be so sacrosanct. It was akin to the priest parishioner, the attorney client, but now banks are nothing but lackeys for the federal government. And in fact, that's how the ATF got wind of this case was that his bank actually notified them and said, this guy is depositing so much cash. We think that he's involved in something illegal. Yeah. And I mean, something that jumps out to me that you said, Edwin, is the conspiracy charges. That's when the federal government, we see this pop up over and over. When you see a conspiracy charge tacked on, you know, typically when someone's charged with a crime, the burden is on the government to prove each and every element of an offense beyond a reasonable doubt. A conspiracy is just a uh, a way of kind of getting around all of that by saying, hey, you had a plan to commit this crime. They don't have to prove the elements of the crime, uh, but they have to show something more than mere preparation, usually more, you know, several people agreeing to engage in this activity. But it's kind of a funny way around of, you know, due process, being informed of what conduct is illegal under the law, and then being able to conform yourself to that conduct. And so uh, when we see conspiracy charges, that's the kind of stuff that we see. Now, we have this conviction, we have sentencing set in July, uh, but, and, and this is, every state's a little bit different, but under federal law, we have what are called the federal sentencing guidelines. And so what they look at is the underlying offense, they look at the person's criminal history, they put it in this kind of diagram and crank out, you know, what you know, they have what they think is presumptively an okay sentence, okay in the eyes of the government in this case. Judges can deviate above and below if they have good cause to do that. Uh, we'll see that in July. But going forward, we have this appeal process. And this is, you know, we've talked about Matt Hoover's case in the past. Um, and this is kind of the sad part of challenging maybe the underlying constitutionality of laws is because, you know, it's somebody's bacon on the line and it's their life getting disruptive. Uh, disrupted in order to challenge these things. So going forward for an appeal, uh, let's just talk about what we can anticipate. I think Matt had a great trial team. I think they had a, a lot of good people working on this case. And let's just assume for argument's sake that evidence and, and, and error is preserved at trial. You know, they properly objected uh, before trial or at the earliest opportunity, they objected at trial. They're going to file their motion for new trial in order to preserve all these errors. 
what is an appeals court as far as looking at a case? Uh, what are they looking at? Well, the appeals court is going to look to see whether or not the judge properly followed the law, whether or not he told the jury what the law was, whether or not he did it properly, whether or not he uh, did something to um, what we call comment on the weight of the evidence. Basically, that's giving the jury the impression that some things are more important than others that they should pay attention to. And a lot of that comes in with regard to their his rulings on evidentiary issues, pretrial issues, which I heard that there was a motion to dismiss filed in this, uh, which he denied, which probably should have really been reviewed, really be reviewed by the appellate court, as well as the jury charge that's ultimately submitted. Uh, and I have not read the jury charge, um, but I've heard that it contained language in there that basically absolved the, the, the United States of having to prove that these actually were machine gun pieces uh, because I believe there was some evidence submitted that uh, the ATF expert who attempted to actually turn these credit card-shaped pieces of metal into Sears uh, was much less successful than they would have liked. I heard that he had uh, he gave uh, four tries at it, failed on three of those, and then on one of those, he only got it to work for a very, very short period of time, which could actually be explained as a malfunction of the firearm, not that it actually had converted the firearm into a full automatic a machine gun. And so if you, you know, the way that the jury charge was written, the judge could have, you know, swayed the jury or led the jury down a path that ultimately was going to lead to conviction, basically not giving them a choice in which it'd be really interesting to hear from the jurors uh, to find out why they did something that clearly is so antithetical to our ideas of civil liberty. Now, when a court is looking at a case for, you know, reversing a case because there is an error, um, they're kind of limited. They have blinders on. They have to limit their discussion to what's in the record, what are the filings in the case, you know, because I've seen people comment, hey, file an amicus brief. Um, you know, there are opportunities to do that kind of stuff. However, the court's going to be limited in scope and what the things they get to look at. Now, there's only a handful of issues where a trial court or an appeals court could look at something for the first time on an appeal. And we talk about those being really fundamental issues like constitutionality or something like that, something that wasn't raised at the trial court. Uh, but for the most part, what they're looking at is, did the judge abuse their discretion when making a ruling? And for the most part, you know, and the you know, these statistics are all over the place, depending on what state you're in. Uh, but what we see is most, I mean, and the entire system is designed to preserve convictions for the most part. I mean, that's how the system is set up. And so when we see a, a an appellate court looking at this stuff, you know, did the judge abuse their discretion? If yes, um, did it harm the outcome of the case is kind of the, the second step in that analysis. And so what do you think, you know, Apart from the jury charge, that's been, in my experience, the number one reason for appellate issues. Where else do you see appellate issues coming? Well, appellate issues come into the fact that uh, what evidence is admitted and what evidence is excluded. And that is raised with uh, objections from the defense counsel. And that's another important part about establishing a record is that not only do you have to object to things, but you have to make sure that your objection is preserved, that yeah. you don't waive it because appellate courts love kicking the can. Like yeah. if they don't have to decide something, they will not. And one of the chief ways they get out of having to decide something is simply by saying, well, uh, the error was not, well, the error was waived. Yeah. Just as silly as this sounds, and I'm sure the defense team, you know, this wouldn't be applied in this case, but you know, you didn't object at the earliest opportunity or you didn't object to trial or you did up trial, but you didn't force the judge to rule on it, or you didn't move for this in your motion for new trial. You know, if, if you miss one of these things, an appellate court might say you're out of luck. Yeah. Or one of my favorites is, is that you objected the first time, but then it was brought up again later and you didn't object then. Yeah. So that's one of the real traps about you know, trying these cases, you're trying any criminal case is that the prosecution will try to sneak things in, even if it's in violation of a pretrial order, a motion in limine, even if it's in violation of a previous objection. And if they are able to sneak it in and you don't object, then they'll say, Oh, you objected to it four times out of five, but in order to preserve error, you should have objected to it five times out of five. Yeah. So what we can anticipate is Matt's defense team 
raising these issues on appeal, saying, hey, the trial court abused its discretion, um, that maybe there was some unsettled, maybe a, the judge didn't rule and, and, and anticipated, hey, this thing's going to be appealed. I mean, especially we look at constitutional issues, First Amendment issues, if that made it into the jury charge or not. Um, so we'll see those issues maybe raised on appeal from the appeals court. Let's say one out of every four cases, you know, an appeals court overturns a case uh, for something for review. Um, what happens? I mean, does Matt Hoover go free? Well, he could go free or his case could be remanded for a new trial. Yeah. And so a lot of times, and I think this is kind of, I think this television's to blame for this a little bit, but when you win an appeal, it doesn't necessarily mean that the case, you know, goes away. It just means kind of you start over from the beginning. And so there could be a lot more to this. Now, apart from just the appeal to the intermediate courts of appeal, we have appeals to the United States Supreme Court, you know, granting certiorari review this case. Uh, for kind of novel issues of law, uh, criminal cases, we don't see a whole heck of a lot of those go to the Supreme Court, uh, but there may be issues ripe for that. Well, uh, certainly with regard to how this is, uh, like I said, I believe it's on its face, an infringement of the First Amendment. What they're basically saying is you can't even talk about these things that may exist. And this gets into the area of uh, this pre-crime. Right. Um, and that's something that's very scary, has very, very uh, chilling effects on the First Amendment. And so if they couch it that way, I think that they may get some traction in the federal court. Now, what can you do at this point in time? Uh, there's a handful of things. Support Matt's legal team, um, Christopher's legal team. The other thing that we think you should do, and we're going to put some language in the description below, is to contact your lawmakers. Now, uh, we see the federal government weaponized in different aspects all over the country. One of that is the ATF and the Department of Justice in this kind of, you know, we're not really expected to know what how to govern ourselves, but maybe you're committing a crime. Maybe the federal government, it's changing its mind on rules, but contacting your lawmakers and let them know, hey, I'm concerned about this case. And it looks like we have some overreach or weaponization of the federal government. Uh, that can go a long way. We do have a standing committee in the United States Congress right now investigating these types of things. Yes. And this goes to the the overall process, the, the overall attitude of the ATF is that they are, uh, they are attacking these otherwise, you know, useless inanimate objects and saying, oh, this is something that is prohibited because the law is very clear. What is prohibited or what has to be registered are short, you know, short barreled rifles, short barreled shotguns, firearms that actually shoot more than one bullet with one pull of the trigger devices that are actually functional to uh, diminish the report of a, uh, of a fired firearm. Those are the things that are illegal, but then the ATF comes along and says, no, uh, force reset triggers, uh, solvent traps, bump stabilizing stocks, yeah. braces, bump stocks, these little pieces of metal that can be made if you have the inclination to, into a seer. So instead of actually criminalizing the conduct or criminalizing the actual object, they're just pushing it down the road. And we also see this with um, the uh, ghost guns, one of the terms that I just absolutely despise. Ghost guns, uh, the the kits uh, yeah. Those are legal. and we're another, gonna get another pre crime. Yeah, eighty and eighty percent lawyers, lowers, which we don't even know. Eighty percent lawyers, eighty percent lawyers. Yes, eighty percent lowers, which we don't even know. It's not even eighty percent anymore. Right, it's some sort of amorphous. I mean, soon you can't, you won't even be able to possess an aluminum billet that the ATF says, oh, somebody took a magic marker and drew the shape of a lower on it. That's illegal. Yeah. Go to jail. Really? Go to federal jail. Your hand like that. Yes, the hand gun. Yeah. Um, go to jail, uh, and in federal corrections, they're going to have to serve a whole lot of this time. Yeah. So we wish Matt, Christopher, their legal teams the absolute best. They got the entire system working against them. The system is designed to uphold convictions, but we think there are some novel issues here that are worth looking into. But there is something that you can do. Again, we're going to have that, you know, sample language you could use to contact your representatives on the federal side. The DOJ, the ATF, they need this oversight. They're overstepping their bounds and you can help there. But we hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you did, consider subscribing, hitting that like button and help us fight the anti-2A algorithm by sharing this video. And always leave questions and comments in the section below. We're talking about this because you wanted to hear our opinion on it. And until next time, we're the Armed Attorneys. I agree with you. You were a prosecutor. Yeah.